Hey guys, in this video, I'm going to be introducing you to the concept of impulse and momentum. Okay, so let's get started. First of all, let's say that we've got some particle just here. And let's say that this particle does not have any external forces acting on it yet, which means that it's got a constant velocity in some direction. I'm going to call that V1 right here. Okay, now let's say at some time T1, so let's say at some time T1 at t is equal to t1, we then have a whole bunch of forces being exerted on this particle. So this could be f1, for example, and this could be f2, for example, and let's say we've got a third force acting on this particle, let's call that f3. Okay, well we know that if we've got a whole bunch of forces being exerted on a particle, we can replace that with a net force f net just here, right? And just to reiterate that, the F, um, the net force is just the sum of all your forces. So it's going to be the sum of F1 plus F2 plus F3. Okay, so how do we account for the motion of this particle now mathematically? Well, you're probably really familiar with Newton's laws, which state that your sum of forces acting on a particle is equal to the mass of that object times by the acceleration of that object. Now, this formula probably says a whole lot more than you think it does. Not only does it say that your force is going to be related linearly to your acceleration, but it also says that your force must be in the direction of your acceleration. So they're parallel. And to make that a little bit clearer, let me draw it. This is your acceleration of your particle now, right? That's because it's in the direction of your net force. That's what this formula tells us. It says that the force, your net force is going to be parallel to your acceleration. So this is going to be your acceleration just here. Now before I progress into the mathematics of how to solve for um, the velocities and, and impulses and whatnot, let's use a little bit of intuition here to guess where this particle is going to going to be. Well, if your particle is accelerating in this direction, but it had initial velocity in this direction, then your intuition would probably tell you that at some time, say t2, your particle is going to be right around here. Okay, so at some time t2, so this is at, at t is equal to t2, our particle is right here. And let me just zoom up a bit so you can see. Right, which means that you're going to have some final velocity, and by final I mean v2, in say roughly this direction, v2, and of course if the force is still exerting on it, you're going to have an acceleration still in the same direction, assuming that same force is acting on it. Okay, so that's the intuition covered, let's get back into the mathematics of it. Okay, first, first things first, we know that our acceleration can, is equal to our change in rate of velocity with respect to time, right? We know that from a previous video. So we can actually write this as dv dt dt. So let's, let's substitute that into our formula and we're left with the sum of forces acting on an object is equal to your mass of your object times by dv dt. Okay, well this becomes a, a matter of very, very simple algebra. What I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply dt by both sides and we're left with f net, I'm just replacing the sum of forces with f net, times by dt is going to be equal to, is going to be equal to your mass times by dv. Okay, right. Well, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to integrate both sides with well, I'm going to integrate both sides, and as a result, we've got this funky expression right here. Let's talk briefly about F net. There is nothing at all from preventing F net from being a function of time. It's completely reasonable to expect that in some cases, your force is not going to be constant. So this, this is going to be F net, and it's going to be a function of time. A good example to make you um, understand that is if you throw a ping pong ball up into the air, the wind will be exerting a force on that ping pong ball, and the wind doesn't have to be in the same direction. It can be changing um, all the time. So there's nothing preventing this force right here from being a variable. Okay, that's why we're going to leave it inside the integral sign, right? So if we redraw that, we're going to be left with the integral of f net. Let me keep the colors going. The integral of f net 
dt, right? And let's say we're interested in conducting this experiment from a time t1 to a time to an arbitrary time t2. That means this is going to be equal to the integral of m dv. In the case that mass is constant, we can bring that outside of the integral sign, which is a pretty reasonable assumption. This particle is not going to be losing mass. So that's going to be equal to dv, um, just inside the integral sign. And the limits will be from v1, remember, because v1 was the velocity of our particle at t1, to our final velocity of our object v2, and that's at time t2. Okay, you're probably getting a good idea of where I'm going to go now. What I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite the left-hand side. That's going to be the integral from t1 to t2 of f net times by dt times by tt is going to be equal to your mass times by once you figure out the integration, it's going to be, well, that's just going to be v2 minus v1, right? And simplifying this out a little bit more, we know that's just going to be equal to mv2 let me keep the colors going again. M V2 minus M V1. And that's going to be equal to this funky expression on the left hand side. Now, physicists have named this expression on the left hand side impulse. Oops, I went too far. This is going to be impulse right here. That's what they call it. They call this this integral impulse. Right? And and that's an, an impulse gives you a really good understanding of the influence the force has on a particle over an amount of time that the force is being exerted on that particle. Okay, now that's impulse on the left hand side, but this is our change in linear momentum. Remember, momentum was your mass of your object times by your velocity of your object at that same time, right? So this right here is going to be your momentum at your second time minus your momentum at your first time, which is just going to be your change in momentum. It's going to be P1, sorry, P2 minus P1. Okay, that's your change in momentum. That is our formula right here. That we're going to be using this formula a whole lot in the future. But to make sure that this concept is really well understood, let me actually show you the small little animation I made. Okay, so this is the formula we've got. Um, we just arrived. Notice V dash can also be written as V2. Let's say we've got an object without an external force acting on it yet of um, a velocity V1. Then at some time T1, a force ex gets exerted on it. In, in, for simplicity, I've shown the force to be constant, but it doesn't have to be. And while the force is being exerted on the object, the object accelerates in the direction of the force until the object does not have the force being exerted on it, and then it leaves with that final velocity v2 or v dash. So I'm going to let that run a few more times to let that sink in a bit. But really, all it's saying is the object will remain at a constant velocity until a force gets exerted on it, and then what will happen is the force will start accelerating the object in the direction of the force and then as soon as the object stops um, having a force exerted on it then it's going to travel at a constant velocity so I'll let that run a few more times to really let it sink in okay okay one more time constant velocity accelerating constant velocity okay and just to read out what t1 and t2 are in this case t1 right now and T2, there we go. Okay, guys, I hope that makes sense.